uh, last session we covered conditional random fields up until this point. So what is the idea? You have a neural network. Let's say this is fully convolutional network and it's doing per pixel classification. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you for this particular pixel, there is this chance that this is a background. For this uh, same pixel, there is this chance that it's, a, it's an airplane, etc. And these are the outputs. So you have a neural network that's outputting the probability that this point belongs to this particular class. But these are all independent. When you want to actually write down your label, you have the simple route, which is just look at this pixel, read off the values of every single channel here, and pick out the maximum. And that's going to be the corresponding label here. But as one of you mentioned, when you are predicting a pixel, you shouldn't be looking at it independently, because then you're going to end up with some holes here and there. Um, maybe it's a good idea while doing the prediction to look at the points that are nearby. And by nearby, I mean perhaps they have the same color or they are positionally speaking close to each other. And then now your pixels, you are not treating them as independent anymore. Your neural network is, but your post-processing step is not. Okay, so far so good. And then you can have L labels for each pixel, and then you can write down an energy function, which is always conditioned on the image, on the input image, but for notational convenience, you can just drop the conditioning. But in the back of our heads, we know that there is always an input image. These size, psi of u, they are independent. They are looking at every pixel independently, and they are looking at the scores coming out of your neural network. So these size are exactly these scores that you see here. They are coming out of your neural network. This psi p is something that we are designing. And what properties do we want out of this psi p? This is pairwise energy component, and that's where p is coming from. We want it to encourage similar pixels to have similar labels. And how are we going to do it? We are going to look at some features for this particular pixel and some other pixel, pixel i, pixel j. And these features are hand designed. For instance, you say if two pixels are close to each other, they should be more likely to have the same label. So the, close, the closeness in the space could be one of these features. What else? Uh, if they have the same color, these two pixels, you look at your original image, that's why it is conditioned on the input image. If they have similar colors, even if they are far, maybe they should have the same label. You encourage them to have the same label. And then it's a weighted combination of those uh, Gaussian distributions. And we know that Gaussians, if two points are close to each other, they are going to have a higher value. And when they are far further apart, because of that negative of the square term, the square distance, they are going to have a value that goes to zero. So if these two are close to each other, you're emphasizing that they should be similar. And if they are far from each other, you're emphasizing that they should not be correlated. It's a linear combination of a bunch of such Gaussian kernels. So it's not only one kernel deciding, it's multiple kernels. And then not only that, you're going to have some label compatibility. For instance, some labels are not compatible with other labels. For instance, uh, in the middle of ocean or in the middle of sea, you shouldn't be noticing or identifying any cars. So these are the label compatibility, okay? Once you write down that energy, you try to minimize it with respect to the labels, and these are your labels. And, up, and if you look at it, if you minimize this energy, let's go back to the probability that we wrote last session. If you minimize the energy because of this negative sign and the exponential, you're maximizing the probability of that pixel being classified as an airplane while looking at the pixels in the neighborhood. So that what, that's what you're doing with conditional random fields. But what is the problem now? This probability is no more an easy probability to write down and work with. And what do I mean by easy? It's not independent. You cannot write it as the product of the pixels, the probability of the pixels. So working with it is hard. What you're gonna do 
is you're going to approximate P by another distribution, which is the product of a bunch of independent distributions, pixel-wise distributions. And as soon as you have that, let's assume you are able to do that, you're able to find these cues, then you, you can look at your pixels independently and try to maximize the Q, the adjusted probability of that particular pixel independently. So if you can achieve this, then it's going to be great. And this is called approximate maximum posterior marginal inference. You look at every marginal distribution independently and try to maximize them. So that's the idea. There is an algorithm that's going to do that for us. I'm going to write down the algorithm right now. But we are, that algorithm is going to need some inputs. What are the inputs? You look at the predictions of your neural network. These are the scores coming out of your neural network. These are these psi u's. You multiply them by negative sign. And this is where the negative sign is coming in, because now we are looking at the probabilities, not the energy anymore. And let's just call that ui of l. It is the negative of the score of pixel i having labeled L. That's how we can interpret this. And then in the CRF, we had these parameters. Some of them are these weights. And previously, we were setting these uh, using some ad hoc methods. We were treating them as hyperparameters. Now you can actually treat them as a parameter. So these Ws are your parameters. And these mu's, if you pick one label, and another label, it's going to give you a matrix. And then that matrix could be some of the CRF parameters. And in the previous slide, we were just setting these to be one, except for when L and L prime were the same. But now we can actually train on them. And don't worry about these five iterations in training and 10 in testing. I'm going to come back to this. This is the algorithm. The input to the algorithm are these scores that are coming out of your neural networks. So these are the negative of the scores. And because these are a bunch of scores, you can push them through a softmax, which is the exponential normalized. And those are going to give you some probabilities, some cues. And these are not yet approximating your p's. These are very bad approximations still, because these are all independent. This is as if you're dropping this there. So this is a bad approximation initially, but then you're going to do some iterations to make these cues better and better. So you can do five iterations in training and 10 iterations in testing. So this while not converged is actually a for loop. Do this five times, do this 10 times. And there are actually guarantees that this algorithm converges to the true P given enough iterations. Okay, now you're going to take these cues for every single pixel in your space. You know the corresponding cues. Now you're going to start paying attention using this kernel that you defined these Gaussian kernels, to every single pixel in your image. So this pixel i is going to look at all of the pixels, all other pixels in the image. If you want to implement this operation in a naive way, the first thing that comes to, my, to your mind is you have two for loops on your pixels. One for loop is picking pixel i. The other for loop is doing this summation. So you have two for loops. And the cost of doing that is going to end up being order your pixels squared. So it's going to be order n, n is the number of pixels squared. There are some smart people who can actually compute the same term in order n time. And that's called a permutohedral lattice implementation. So it's a smart implementation. It has nothing to do with deep learning. It is actually from the message passing literature. So you can implement that fast. The rest of them are these Ws being multiplied by these Q tildes with the summation, you can actually interpret that as a one by one convolution. What else? Then you need these mu's getting multiplied by these Q hats. There is a summation over your labels also. You can interpret that as yet another one by one convolution. Then there is this uh, unary subtraction, which you're going to subtract uh, Q from U. And you remember are coming out of your neural network. And Q hat, you just computed it using a one by one combination. Now, these are going to be scores. To turn them into probabilities, you're going to push that through another softmax to normalize them to probabilities. So, that's the algorithm 
And after a couple of iterations, you are getting better and better and up at approximating your probability, which is paying attention to every single pixel on your image. We can actually implement that using a recurrent neural network. It's a specialized recurrent neural network, but it has this recursive fashion. U goes in. Why do you need it? Because you need to subtract something from it. Q from the previous iteration is going to go in. So this Q is going to go up there again and then get reprocessed. So Q is going to go in and your image is going to go in. You do some message passing, which is this operation here. You can do it in order of your pixels time. So it's as good as a convolution. You are going to do some reweighting, multiplying by Ws, which is a one by one convolution. You make sure that they are compatible. Another one by one convolution. This unary operation is just subtraction. We can think of it as a shortcut, similar to ResNet. And then you normalize. You push it through a softness. And then you repeat. Q out is going to go back as Q in for the next iteration. And then you iterate five times during training and 10 times when you're actually doing your inference. So you can interpret CRF as a recurrent neural network. And you're going to get some very impressive results. Even your ground truth is not detecting these points as backgrounds, but your CRF is doing. So before I finish, this RNN on top and these parameters specifically are going to end up being the parameters of your RNN. We can write on a loss based on the outcome. So basically, you have your convolutional neural network that's giving you these pixels, that's giving you these U's. You take that, you push it through your uh, recurrent neural network a couple of times, and then you write down this loss function, and you can optimize over these parameters, these weights and the compatibility weights. Or like what we were doing last session, you can treat these as hyperparameters, use your intuition, maybe set all of these to be ones, and these guys, you set them based on your intuition and multiple trial and errors, and then uh, just use it as a post-processing step. I think I'm going to stop here for questions before we go to the next topic. So are there any questions? Was everything clear? So there is a good question in the chat. What are the metrics to evaluate the segmentation task? And this we covered in the first paper. So pixel accuracy, mean accuracy, mean intersection over union, and frequency weighted intersection over union. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other ones? And your question is actually relevant because your ground truth is not perfect. Then you're not going to notice in your metric that CRF RNN is actually doing a good job compared to deep lab. So there is a question can the loss function be catered based off what metric you want to use? Uh, usually, when you want to do training, you're going to try to do maximum likelihood. And when you want to do evaluation, you're going to write down some metric. But there are actually works that try to do that, try to choose their loss function so that it is close to their metric. But there is a catch. Usually, these metrics that you write down, they're going to end up being uh, discontinuous or their derivatives being discontinuous. But your likelihood is going to end up being nice and differential. Does that answer your question? For instance, accuracy is a discrete metric. We cannot differentiate through it. Any other ones? Okay, perfect.